everyone. Welcome to this McKinsey Global Institute Economic Insights virtual event on our latest report called Will Productivity and Growth Return After the COVID-19 Crisis? I'm Janet Bush, Senior Editor at MGI. Productivity is a topic near and dear to MGI's heart and has been a core theme for us since our founding 30 years ago. Here to walk you through the findings of our new report is MGI partner Jan Mishka, who's joining us from Zurich today. We'll then move on to our distinguished panel discussion uh, with four economists and MGI academic advisors. They are Martin Bailey, Hans Helmut Kotz, Michael Spence and Laura Tyson. Welcome to every one of you. The panel will be moderated by MGI Director Jonathan Wurzel, who is joining us from Shanghai today. Um, following the panel, um, we'll take your questions via chat. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. And obviously, we'll do our best to get to as many questions as possible. Should you have any technical issues, please use the chat feature below and send a direct message to technical producer or event manager, and we will do our best to help you. So welcome, everyone. Enjoy the session. And I'll now hand over to Jan. Thank you very much, Janet. And uh, to give you an overview of our finding, what we see is that there is a substantiated opportunity for a full percentage point acceleration in productivity growth. That would be double the rate that we've seen after the global financial crisis, or even more than that, and and a massive acceleration of growth where we could see GDP growth rates on the order of two and a half percent in real terms if realized. But there's still two barriers to overcome. On the one hand, action so far appears concentrated among leading firms. So we need to spread it more widely across the broad swath of firms. And secondly, the very action that firms are taking and the nature of the crisis are also amplifying structural drags on demand that we will need to solve in the years ahead. So what we did in this research is that we looked at things from the from the supply as well as from the demand side. On the supply side, there's of course a lot of discussion on whether we might see a period of, of sclerosis and particularly slow productivity growth, or whether the accelerated dynamism from the shock of the pandemic can get us into a faster gear on the productivity side. But even if that happens, we might still see a repeat of the aftermath of the global financial crisis where relatively weak demand, sustained output gaps, weak investment held back growth. So we would also need to make sure that demand is actually strong, bringing us to a high pressure economy to see something akin to the aftermath of World War II. And the stakes are very high. A decade of growth difference of this order of magnitude would be akin to $17,000 in GDP per capita in the US. So we're going to start with the supply side. We, of course, see all the things that ha are happening across firms. Many media have already reported on accelerated digitization and the like. Uh, so we try to see what about the anecdotal evidence is also broader themes and what does it mean for productivity? And we conducted a survey among about 600 senior executives in Europe and the US. Uh, and of course, we saw 60% said acceleration and shift to digital channels. That's the story much told. Also on automation and technology, of course, a lot of discussion already around on digital um, acceleration, uh, where in many debates, that is a little bit confusing with buying a few PCs and servers for remote work. So we explicitly asked only about non-remote work acceleration of, of automation and technology. And a whopping 75% of firms said they would accelerate that over the next five years, 20 percentage points up from those who did it over the past five years. What is maybe also a story a little bit less told is that aside from all the digitalization, there's also a shift to much more agile organization and operating models, much faster decision making, as well as as you can see here, according to 55% of our respondents, also an acceleration in innovation and business model disruption. And to give you just a, one example of that, 
if you look at the construction sector, which maybe for decades should have thought about how can they actually move construction off-site, modularize, industrialize their processes. Now this crisis has given them another amplifier to overcome barriers to adoption, to take on the kind of risks that are associated with it. And we see in a lot of discussions that large firms are now making up their strategies, doing the first careful investments that will then scale up over the years to come. Service, uh, service respondents are also quite optimistic on the productivity potential, so they actually see a 3.1% a year opportunity for their firms. Now, we are a little bit more careful in our estimate here, which we base on deep reviews of eight sectors. I'm only showing uh, four here. Um, and to give you some examples, in healthcare, telemedicine, in the UK's National Health Service, online consultations have gone up from 10 to 85 percent of all consultations. Not all of that will remain, but some of it will remain sticky. And when we talk to our experts, telemedicine is more productive in that it reduces frictions and waiting times. It uh, enables faster triage to the right specialists, and it also allows to digitize then the back end, both administrative processes, but over time also in terms of the diagnostics. I also may already mentioned construction. There's also a massive acceleration to the use of building integration modeling and digital twins that is also forced upon companies in order to continue working with the ongoing health and safety restrictions. In ICT, scale, for instance, helps. Uh, BT saw a 2.5x increase in demand for bandwidth upgrades. These deliver higher customer value, more revenues for the company but don't require a requisite increase in workers and hours worked, so they will boost productivity. And of course, in retail, the much told story about shift to e-commerce, but also warehouse automation, uh, advanced analytics, as well as experiential stores. So a full percentage point for the full or total business economy as an upside potential. But of course, much of that action we see mostly in large firms. So what about the smaller firms? What is the spread of the progress. We looked at Q3 data in, uh, in 2020 of firm action. And if, if I just take like the second row here, the example of R&D, 53% of US firms and 41% of European firms actually increased R&D through the crisis. Those are very substantial numbers, but let's also be cognizant, these are 14 and 22 points less than a year earlier. And also, if you look at, again, staying with the R&D example, um, who made the biggest strides forward, then 66% uh, in the US of all R&D advances were just coming from large superstar firms. So there's a little bit of a question whether the longer tail of firms is moving along or indeed making way uh, and, what, and, and seeing creative destruction and high business dynamism. And on that front, it's actually quite intriguing to see how the number of bankruptcies across the countries analyzed largely collapsed in the US, 28% down. And if you look at that by sector, then this is actually also and even particularly true in the worst hit sectors like hospitality. So the government support packages seem to sustain a lot of businesses. And at some point, of course, we will see the aftermath of, of this building up. On the upside, though, there's a few countries, the US and Sweden, where also new business formations actually accelerated. And also in France, Germany, and the UK, at least they didn't kind of collapse as fast as one might have feared. So there's some mixed messages about the longer tail of companies, um, and the jury is still out, and we have to take concerted actions to make sure they move alongside and also accelerate productivity. Now then there is, of course, the demand side of things. If we see all those advances by firms, but we see that in a macro environment that is sluggish, then a few not so desirable outcomes are possible. So we might see at least a temporary rise in unemployment. Uh, we might also see sustained output gaps, slow wage growth, and the like that actually weighing down on the incentives for firms to invest. 
And we would also find an environment where it's hard for the most productive firms to gain market share and this way contribute to economy-wide growth. And there's some reason for concern. Already prior to the pandemic, there was arguably a period that some uh, would term secular stagnation. Uh, in the US, for instance, median wage growth, trade productivity growth by 19% since the turn of the millennium, uh, which drags down private consumption. And capital intensity growth was the weakest since World War II. So also the investment front wasn't exactly strong. In the pandemic, of course, things got worse. So nine percentage points increase in personal savings rates, mostly higher income households saving on the spending that they would otherwise have done for personal and hospitality services of mostly lower income households. And uncertainty skyrocketed holding back investment. Now our research shows that looking ahead, when we look at all the productivity actions that we find, 60% of them seem to be geared more towards efficiency and reducing work input and hours rather than growing the top line, improving the value of products and services offered. All of that is not a problem if we make sure that the overall macro environment stays strong or becomes strong again. And of course, in the US, a $1.9 trillion bill might go a long way to overcome that, depending on what the money is being spent on and at what point in time. In Europe, um, the question is still a little bit stronger looming. So where does that take us? A full percentage point productivity and overall growth opportunity. If we support demand, first and foremost, investment. So firms really quickly reallocating their capital to far high growth opportunities, and also in the scenario planning, making sure there could actually be a massive upside to growth not holding back, not being too fearful of risk, there is a scenario out there that is very positive for growth. Secondly, of course, standards and externality pricing and regulation for green investment and sustainable development goals. That is an obvious gap uh, investment for some time. And then, of course, public investment in areas like infrastructure, where both sides of the Atlantic have, have consistently underinvested about half a percent of GDP in infrastructure. Then there's supporting incomes and consumption and making sure that actually median wage growth is in line with productivity growth. This has a lot to do also with having the right skills, supporting worker transitions, but also, of course, firms can take actions whether vis a vis their most vulnerable workers. And then it's about making sure that on the supply side, the action that we see by leading firms is actually broadening throughout the entire business ecosystem. For firms, that could mean that the leading firms can involve their entire ecosystems in our innovation efforts. This is particularly, of course, true of platform companies that have a choice between, on the one hand, being the provider of digital services and platforms for small, smaller firms to innovate on top or competing with them and make, uh, affecting the opposite. It is also about investing in the kind of reskilling, both in terms of the sector transitions, but also in the digital skills that are needed. Um, there is a world where we might tie some of the support packages to some of the shifts that are required sector by sector, whether that's industrial construction, whether that is autonomous driving and electric driving, uh, or you name it. There's, of course, investing in digital infrastructure, including soft infrastructure like digital identities. And last but not least, also structural supply side policies like labor and product market regulation. And with that, uh, I hand it over to Jonathan for the panel discussion. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Jan. And uh, it's a pleasure to be back with uh, a group of very distinguished people and uh, far smarter than us who have uh, been part of at MGI, but who have been part of creating this uh, this this report and uh, and commenting on it, and I'm going to start off with a um, with a simple question. I was like listening to Jan and sort of reading the report. Um, what's uh, what's surprising about it to you? And I'm going to, I'll start with you, Hans Alma, because you were of course involved. So maybe we could frame it for you as uh, 
what was surprising about the, what you discovered during the report? <laughs> you need to unmute, uh, guys. Thanks, Martin. That's great, Jonathan. I thought you would have put me at the end of the list and I would have been in a bind to come up with what surprised me. Um, what I found remarkable, really remarkable, uh, and that is based on stuff you wouldn't get if you look into public data uh, surveys. And we were surveying a group of decision makers. Uh, what really surprised me there that they have this uh, intention to go to go big, to, to make use of the opportunity. It shouldn't have surprised me that much because if you look at historical situation, that has been happening quite often. Uh, happening in certain uh, periods when when you could use the opportunity to reorganize your business lines. For example, this uh, point of Bob Solo, you see the computer, except uh, for the statistic, turned out to be corrected uh, a decade later because then there was the opportunity to reorganize. And that's what we, what we are seeing here. Uh, I guess I stopped there. Okay, so don't waste a good crisis. And uh, we I had one. Um, uh, Laura, what, what was surprising to you? I think the, the, the perhaps the magnitude of the uh, potential effect on productivity, it's a very large number, <laughs> increasing productivity growth by a full percentage point. I have seen some other numbers. For example, the CBO in the United States just came out saying, yeah, there's going to be a productivity increase, maybe from 1.2% uh, to 1.5%. What I liked about the, the, the paper a lot, so that number, that top line number is surprising. On the other hand, I think the sectoral detail actually provides some empirical support for that possibility. Because again, the aggregate numbers don't take into account the potential uh, in very large parts of the economy, uh, continuing in retail, uh, health, uh, construction, very interesting uh, addition to the list of sectors that are very important where one would expect productivity growth. So I was surprised by the size. Uh, I think the macro forecasters tend to predict a productivity increase that's smaller, but I really like the sectoral detail because I think it's compelling uh, in terms of what can be accomplished once you look within the sectors. Wonderful. Let's we'll come back to the sector point because I think it's very uh, relevant as we think about the policies that are needed going forward to, to realize that. But uh, uh, Michael, um, uh, what were your reactions? Uh, how did that? Uh, how did this strike you? And what was surprising about it? Well, I liked it because it you know dug deeply, and I guess, I guess I was surprised mainly by the breadth of the commitment that that emerged in the surveys that the that the, the folks who did the study, the breadth of commitment. I mean, we knew the pandemic was a big shock and we knew it was a source of resilience and we knew there was a kind of uh, overcoming of inertia and an uptick in adoption. But the, but as Laura said a minute ago, the breadth of it is really, if it, has, if it actually occurs, is really very striking. And it will, um, notwithstanding some questions about small, small medium-sized businesses, it, it will change the picture that emerged in lots of earlier MGI studies about lagging sectors like education, healthcare, and a whole whole set of others. So so it maybe it's not a huge shock, but it was a pretty big surprise. Showing the economy wide effect of the whole thing as opposed to you know, narrowly uh, focused on a particular set. So um, great. And and Martin, um, how what was what was your reactions as a veteran well, of MGI studies? <laughs> I think my colleagues have done a good job, and uh, I, I was surprised by the same things they were surprised by. Um, I think it's remarkable. I expected during the pandemic that uh, most companies, even large companies, would be in sort of survival mode uh, rather than in necessarily looking uh, for ways to improve productivity. So that the fact that we had uh, large companies and maybe some smaller companies as well figuring out how they could uh, make themselves more uh, efficient. I mean, that's uh, one thing in a way that, that you sort of expect in hard times, you look uh, uh, for ways to cut costs, but in practice that often uh, doesn't happen. So I was, uh, I was impressed uh, 
by the responsiveness, and, and this was in the United States as well as in, excuse me, the Europe and the United States uh, both. This happened not just on in uh, one region or the other. So would you uh, then coming back to what Hans Helmut was saying at the beginning about uh, maybe this time is different? Uh, would you would you think that we will this time you know escape our uh, solo paradox that uh, you know everybody talks about productivity but you see it <laughs> you don't see it in the numbers? Will will this time be different? Will, will we see it in the numbers? <laughs> Well, I think we'll see some of it. I don't know that we'll go back to the rapid productivity growth that we had after World War II, uh, or even that we had for a while in the 1990s. Uh, but I do expect productivity growth to be faster than it uh, than it's been. Well, it was very slow from um, really about 2004 until 2019, picking up a little bit the last uh, few years, particularly slow right after the, the Great Recession. Um, so I do. I'm not, I am optimistic. I share the optimism of the of the report, thinking that we will do better. Now, some of the increases, I, and I think some of the innovation that's happening, uh, quite a bit of it is in in the biological sciences, which affects healthcare. Uh, that's not always counted in our productivity numbers. It's real, and it's obviously important to all of us. Um, doesn't always get counted in the official productivity numbers. And another thing that's happening that's encouraging um, is that many companies and many uh, smart people in, in academia are figuring out how to make our economy more energy efficient so we don't have as many uh, emissions uh, compared to the size of the economy that we can improve our, our energy efficiency. I think that's absolutely necessary. That's something we've got to do. But again, not all of that is going to get counted in, in the productivity numbers. So I wouldn't. I wouldn't think we're going to go to two and a half percent productivity as we did in the in the nineties or as happened in the fifties uh, and sixties. But I th I certainly think an improvement uh, is something that I would expect to happen. Well, I, I'm raising a really good point about measurement and methodology, and I know that there's a I mean uh, we're, there there are legions hard at work on redefining GDP. So uh, risk for the mill there. Um, but I mean, I mean, just to get one other view on this, uh, Michael, perhaps, I mean, any your view on is this time different? You're seeing the breadth of this uh, uh, of this response. Are we going to see, a, a, you know, a, a, a bounce back that is that is uh, much greater than what we had seen before in, in your, your views? Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, Jonathan, I'm pretty optimistic. I mean, I mean, maybe I'm an outlier here, but I actually think this time may be quite different. In one sense, I mean, you know, these things have long lags associated with them. So one way to frame the question is, are we at the point where we're going to get the acceleration? You know, and I and I think the answer is, at least the way I the way I've come to see it with the help of this study, uh, which is just excellent, is that we we were at the point where a whole a whole set of productivity enhancing opportunities were sitting in front of us and weren't being exercised real fast. And with the boost of the pandemic and some fiscal programs, you know, designed to sort of accelerate things and so on, I, I, I you know, I just think this is, this is probably going to be the moment when we see a really distinctive acceleration. And I don't think the, the reports uh, upside, you know, I mean, it's measured, but I don't think the upside's at all unrealistic. And I would say that globally, U.S., Europe, Europe, you know, I think will, they'll, I mean, it'll be a bit slower here. And certainly China and Asia, I, I, I expect to see the same thing. Well, now, now I'm feeling a, uh, uncharacteristically optimistic. So, uh, Laura, it's time to bring me back down to ground. <laughs> so I, mean, I, I don't think that these things happen necessarily by themselves. I mean, it's great. I think we've heard the case for the, the latent and productivity opportunity. But what policies will we actually need to see to have, you know, to, to feel confident that this is going to materialize you know, in, from, from, from a public uh, government perspective? So. <laughs> So I think we need to start with, the, uh, again, this concept that has come up earlier of the high pressure economy. Uh, we've heard, you know, what Michael was saying is perhaps we're at an inflection point. What Jerome Powell was saying yesterday, the chair of the, uh, the Federal Reserve, uh, is that we're at an inflection point because he believes that we've put enough demand support 
into the U.S. economy, the fiscal support and the monetary support, we are going to be running a high-pressure economy. We are going to be growing fast. We are going to be pulling people back into the labor market fast. That high-pressure economy means strong consumption growth, uh, therefore a strong demand that should bring up the 10-year sort of softness in the business investment rate because let's think of demand in the economy is basically the driver, the major driver of investment, which is also a source of demand, but it actually is responding to demand pressures. So I think the key here is the high pressure aggregate demand economy. And I think the commitment in the US is strong to doing that. Um, I would say, uh, in addition, we are going to have to think about these uh, structural drags that was also mentioned, I think, by Jan, that essentially Jan said in one of his slides, we've got to get wage growth consistent with productivity growth. You know, I don't know how we do that because I would say the history of all of the technologies up to now and going forward, uh, as a reason, the technology growth is one reason why we've had decoupling of wage growth from productivity growth. And I don't see that necessarily changing. I mean, unless, or maybe what you do actually is forget the, the wage growth you have to look at in terms of things like earned income tax credits, minimum wages. I don't think there's a way to require firms to actually set wage growth in line with productivity growth. I don't think it's gonna happen. Uh, where you don't have unions and essentially look at what just happened in Amazon in the United States. No, no worker voice to try to get that wage growth in line with productivity growth. We're going to have to think about ways to support the structural weaknesses in consumption that come from the fact that wage growth has significantly lagged productivity growth. And I think one can do that through a series of policies there, as I said, earned income tax credit, minimum wage, uh, certainly helping in worker transition so that workers who are moving from the lower wage sectors of the economy to higher wage sectors, higher skills can make that transition fast. But we've got it. So high pressure economy overall, high pressure demand, and a series of policies that deal with uh, the structural drags on consumption that come from the delinking of productivity growth and wage growth. And then one other thing I just want to throw in, it, it, I think we really need to think hard about are there incentives we can build into the tax system or into sectors to encourage more investment by the small and medium-sized firms? Because what we've seen in this study, we know it to be true, is that although there was a quick, flexible, amazing response of the big firms in the US and Europe, that, that was not the case throughout the economy. And if we want to get economy-wide productivity benefits, we have to think about are there policies that can encourage the small to medium-sized firms to do more here. I'd be interested in this to hear about what's been going on in Germany since Germany has a large number of small and medium-sized highly productive firms, but I'll leave that, Hans. <laughs> Well, that's no, that's great, uh, Laura. Very, three very clear policy directions around high pressure, addressing structural drags, and incentivizing SMEs. Uh, so, Hans Helmut, how fares the Mittelstand? Uh, what what is the view from Europe? <laughs> you should be fearsome. They are always falling. They are continuing to create its uh, current account surplus, which is uh, horrible, terrible. I I can take it from from Laura. Um, I do think the most important issue will be not to lose speed, which is a danger. So we wouldn't like to repeat uh, 1937 U.S. or 2009-2010 U.S. We should keep up a pace, and that means fiscal policy should should not start talking about now ringing in de deficits, what we're actually hearing here in my country. We should not think about uh, exit contingent on time uh, in terms of monetary policy. So much of what has been happening in terms of pressure in Europe was about a, uh, a, a European Central Bank, which was highly accommodating, highly supportive, keeping interest rates uh, uh, pretty low and giving hence not so much firms, but the public sector the capacity to 
to push. So this high pressure economy notion, I think, is crucial. It's the other side of the plate, two sides of the plate, uh, of, of the scissors doing doing the the cutting. If we do not um, keep that up, I do see a perspective that anything of what we are talking about so marvelously in terms of product productivity growth uh, will be gone. And it will also not only have a macro effect, but it will mean that in particular small SMEs um, might really go into a defensive mode. I wouldn't be so much concerned about those highly specialized, um, completely internationalized uh, SMEs, German type, which are not German, by the way. You find them in Austria, you find them in Sweden, you find them all over the place. Uh, I would be, and they are highly export oriented. I would be much more cons concerned of, of, about the laggards. And, and they would, uh, could easily run into an environment where they can barely survive and would continuously claim for, uh, for support. So that's just the counterfactual uh, scenario, which arises if we do not keep up uh, macroeconomic uh, demand. Well, it, it sounds, Anselma, as you, you're, we're aligned on the high pressure. Um, some question maybe about the SMEs and which of them are lagging or not. What about the structural drags? Is that, uh, is that also a, a risk or a policy issue for, for Europe? Well, structural uh, drags, what Laura was referring to is wages. And she's mainly focusing on the U.S. In Europe, of course, you have wages which didn't lose as, as much compared to productivity. So we do not have unions as we had them, but still we have a, in some countries a rather com, uh, cooperative environment. Actually, you, you have uh, unions uh, being on the board <coughs> and, and all the large ones. So I, 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 one can imagine a more concerted cooperative way of, of handling this. And they are, of course, not trying to stop productivity enhancement or innovation. Actually, they're pushing it. Uh, that's the old modern European model, if you, if, you, if you like. Wages can be high if productivity is high. And then I stop. Wages in these northern European economies are very high, much higher than in the US for a reason. Well, I think that that is definitely a point of difference <laughs> between our US and European context. And I'm going to come back to that. But, but while we're on the topic of demand, maybe I could turn to you, Martin and, and Michael. Um, the, uh, we, this is, in our writing of the report, one of the challenges of our writing was to be able to frame productivity potential enabled by, but still requiring demand. And that and this is very hard to say one has productivity if one doesn't also say one has demand, because the one doesn't really come without the other. So what what do you see as the policies or, uh, to address this specific demand side question? And particularly if I add in an element of the technology shift in the sense we're seeing productivity enabled by, by, by technology, but sometimes this technology itself can affect demand um, by essentially requiring job transitions and, and, uh, and, and potentially therefore creating a, a of effect in the actual uh, consumption. So I, I'm, I'm curious as to, do you see that as a threat that the, that this act, the, 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 the cure is almost worse than the disease or are there ways to mitigate this um, in the, in the policy framework? Uh, maybe start with you, Michael. Mm -hmm. Well, so a lot, then my colleagues who already said a lot of sensible, this is a really hard problem, right? So but let, well, let me just try to, or break it down. First of all, we could get productivity um, gains to some extent without the demand growth, in which case we'll have this transitional employment problem. I mean, for sure. That's point one. Point two, um, you know, it, things are going to go a lot better, you know, if the various dimensions of this high pressure economy are maintained. But one of the things that strikes me about the Biden administration is that they not, it's not just a big fiscal stimulus, but it is clearly targeted at, you know, creating demand pressure in it precisely in the parts of the income distribution, let's call it middle income, that have 
experienced the worst, some of the worst versions of this divergence between productivity growth and so on. So I think there's some reason to hope that they're heading, they may not describe it the same way, but they're heading kind of in the right direction. Um, so, uh, you know, so on balance, I, and then there's the skill things that Laura and many others have studied in some detail. Um, and there I think the Europeans have an advantage. Uh, you know, basically, you get skills when businesses, governments, educational institutions commit. And you get skills transitions that are faster um, and more effective when people have the resources. So if your starting point is the U.S. starting point, where the income and wealth distribution has gotten completely out of hand, you know, over a historical period, um, and the social security systems are not as well built as they are, in, at least in the northern European countries, um, I think that's a that that's not an unrecoverable position, but that's not going to be that that'll be a drag. And and finally, you know, we have the report doesn't really dwell on this, but I know that the the authors thought about it. Is we are in a period structurally where an enormous amount of value is being created and measured by intangible assets, and the and the returns to that are flowing through a very very small number of people in our economies. And so in, in it, in it, that is not an easy problem even to think about reversing or, or resist a trend that's easy to resist even with policy um, objections. So I, I think, you know, bottom line is um, this is going to be an adventure. The potential is great, but the demand side is, uh, is really hard. Um. Martin, over to uh, your your take on that. Adding in what Michael has just uh, noted around intangibles and how that uh, the fact that that's a big part yes, of our productivity solution. So, it, it it's a key point, and I, I uh, endorse what what Michael said. I mean, if if you go back to the productivity growth, strong productivity growth that we had in earlier periods, where you were sort of building factories or expanding out uh, the kind of jobs that went with the capital. So the capital uh, really naturally uh, resulted in um, more employment and, and the kind of wages, pretty good wages that went, went with it. Now we often have a different kind of productivity fueled by knowledge capital and other kinds of intangible capital. And uh, so some of our most valuable firms now um, don't necessarily employ an awful lot of people. So it, it is a different environment from that point of view. Um, what do you do about that? It's a, it's a hard problem. Uh, I think the Europeans do better than us, as Michael said, in terms of uh, creating skills um, and really matching the skills to what employers are looking for. Uh, our record in the United States of skill training, first of all, we don't do very much of it, and the, and the amount that we do often has not worked very well. So we I think we're really behind uh, on that, I think that's something we wish uh, really try to improve. Uh, I think we we have a system in the United States that's geared to sort of university and college training, and we need to take advantage of that so that the uh, community colleges work with businesses to find out what jobs are available, what what jobs are, uh, need to be filled, and what skills are required to fill those. Uh, you know, some states do better than others. Some uh, localities do better than others. We need to learn uh, from those that have done it best. But that's something certainly when the United States, I think, falls short and uh, is reflected in uh, wages and some of the social issues that we have. Uh, in terms of aggregate demand, I think the United States has done actually better than Europe historically. Um, and I think we do have, uh, you know, uh, Biden has introduced a big stimulus uh, program. Uh, I think we will get, together with sort of pent-up demand, uh, I think we will get uh, really quite a considerable boom going forward uh, in the rest of this year and maybe into, into next year because not all the money is going to get uh, spent in, in, in one year. So I think the U.S. will do pretty well on the demand side and, and push us towards a high-pressure economy, which I agree with my colleagues is something that would be very helpful. Um, historically, Europe has not done so well, didn't do very well after the financial crisis. Um, and that's partly because uh, there's not a, a sort of unified fiscal 
uh, structure to take advantage of that. I think the European Central Bank has done what it, what it could. Um, I think there is some recognition in Europe uh, that that needs to change and, and uh, more needs to be done on the, on the fiscal side. But that, I think, may be more of a problem uh, in, in Europe going forward. Well, I'm, I'm gonna, I mean, I think it's important to start turning to that question around the, um, well, some of them rephrase it as, as creative destruction, and sort of to what extent do we see a model in the U.S. of like, well, you know, there, some have phrased it as a more dynamic uh, economy and the U on the European side more about avoiding scarring. And so, I mean, different, different sort of sentiments, but do they actually play out differently? Um, do you think that, you know, in the case of Europe, there might be a need for uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, the, the, the fis a more unified fiscal structure to support um, a, uh, a more aggressive restructuring, uh, Hans Helmut, to, to pick up there? We talked a bit about some of those lagging SMEs. What's the, what's the policy uh, outlook there or the opportunity? Mm -hmm. uh, fiscal policy is the remit of nation states. Uh, the EU um, has only one, by the way, 1%, uh, uh, oh, the EU budget is uh, barely 1% of Euro, uh, European GDP. Nation states in Europe have a much higher share, as you know, than it is the case for the US. Hence, our automatic stabilizers are significantly, significantly larger. And we also have a welfare system where you do not need to write checks uh, throw them to people who are living in Singapore, friends of mine, or or, or, or Lisbon. Uh, so that, that that's a difference. Uh, on the other hand, I completely agree with 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 Martin. Um, there might be a major risk, and that's one of the questions which came up right at the beginning of in our chat by uh, Miss Chen, if I recall it correctly. Could there be divergence? Yes, there could. If the U.S. is uh, going strongly and Europe is on the brakes, and there's a risk of that, by the way, uh, then uh, things will turn out not very, if they will really turn out mediocre in the north and badly in the south of Europe, tensions in, in increasing. And let me make, uh, so two points in addition to that. There's lots of diversity in Europe, also at the national level not only between North and South, but also between France and Germany. Germany came up immediately when the crisis hit with an eight percentage point fiscal impulse. Uh, France, barely half of it. Now we are again here in Germany thinking about on our national level uh, to come, come in again because we are in, ahead of the third wave. France has been much more reluctant. Fiscal capacity reasons. Uh, you, the ECB was uh, capable of uh, engineering an interest rate level which could allow uh, otherwise very fragile economies to also to use fiscal policy, but it has been used in a very differential way. And the final or second point is we have this big next generation EU program, which is mainly thought about being infrastructure for four years, 750 billion. It might get derailed. Uh, it is uh, uh, in front of the German Constitutional Court, and there might be um, uh, there might be some restraints uh, uh, put in it. So Europe is uh, in a difficult situation if they do not get their act together in terms of keeping up the pressure. I think we are we are at a crucial moment. We might be losing out. Well, well, I mean, to that point, when you say Europe, of course, I mean, you just said a fiscal nation states are at risk. So do you see it being specific parts of Europe that are at risk or the whole uh, thing? Sure. So it's, uh, there, 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 there are those economies who are highly tourist dependent, hospitality, uh, and they are in the south of Europe. Hmm. They have output gaps which are substantially higher than those uh, in the north, so we would see an increase in tension within uh, within Europe. The the nimble ones in the north might not be doing that badly. They will they they will be under underperforming, uh, but that would uh, can easily create um, 
significant pressure within Europe, which makes it an, an environment which is terrible for the for the central bank. Yeah. So, Laura, if I come back to you, what about that question for the United States? Um, could you see divergence within the United States as you look across regions and uh, between rural and urban and places people are moving from or moving to? Um, there's been a lot of news about people leaving California. Yes. So, what do you think? Uh Yes, let me, let me say at the beginning that the news uh, is not really supported so far by the numbers. So if you we do follow in migration, out migration, we don't see anything dramatically different. What though related to your point, and you can see this in a very large economy in California with very distinctive regions, is yeah, there is regional divergence and there are implications um, for they're both positive, maybe we'll get less, and uh, acceleration, maybe we'll get more on divergence. On the maybe we'll get less, I think we don't know yet. Uh, this was pointed out in the uh, McKinsey study on how uh, all of this is affecting uh, the labor market. We don't know yet the extent to which the large employers in urban areas are going to bring their workers back to their place of work. We, we don't know that yet. And right now what you have in California is you have a sort of sense of, okay, it's likely that we won't have to go back to work every day. So let's uh, move into the suburbs. Let's move further away from the city. So the de-urbanization, uh, that, that, that or the, the the reduction in the intensification of urbanization, which would which had been going on before, might actually lead to a bit less divergence among regions, and I, and I think that is uh, I personally think that is quite a likely outcome. That um, and you can see that just in terms of patterns of investments by companies sort of looking to build a new facility, say in in Cleveland, as opposed to a new facility in Los Angeles. So I, I think um, there's some possibility here of uh, reversing this. There had really been in the United States, this, uh, and we people were surprised by it, accelerating divergence among regions, and particularly urban and uh, rural. And uh, I think we may see uh, some improvement there. I, I actually think I worry more about the divergence of uh, income by skill. So I one of the other in the labor report that I view as a companion piece in a way to this investment report and productivity report, um, it's clear that all of the acceleration of digitization and automation is going to uh, it's going to increase the dislocation of workers. It's going to continue to put serious pressure on middle income jobs. It's going to require this transition from these low wage jobs, low skill jobs to the higher skill, high wage jobs that develop over time. But boy, that is a very complicated transition. And it is quite possible that if we don't get it right, there actually is even more, here the divergence is income inequality. It's wage inequality. It's capital share of income versus labor share of income. Right now, I don't see anything that would suggest those trends will not continue. So I, I, I think, boy, just look again at the numbers the, in your survey of firms, what it was something like 60% were saying they were adopting the technology to economize on labor and other costs. But the first one was labor, okay. Uh, another, another one of the surveys I've seen, the World Economics Forum said, 43% uh, of the firm surveyed said they expect a net reduction in the size of their workforce from automation. That, that's what they, 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 they're investing, they're digitizing, they're, they expect a net reduction. So this is going to, I think, make the, the challenges of wage distribution, the link between wage growth and productivity growth, the transition of workers from declining uh, sectors to uh, emerging sectors, emerging activities, is going to exacerbate all of those. So I think of divergence more that way 
divergence in remuneration of skills uh, than I do in uh, regional. I think actually on the productivity and automation and technological development side, we might actually see, uh, as I said, a kind of somewhat reversal or moderation of the regional intensification or the intensification of regional differences, which had been ongoing pre-pandemic. That's uh, eloquently stated, and uh, you know, I, 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 you know I, I certainly see that. I'm going to sort of paraphrase to say the best of times, worst of times. So best of times for those high wage, high skill workers, maybe not so much for, for other people. And in that context, I would note that real estate markets are quite robust right now. Um, <laughs> those, uh, and that's being driven by those high wage, high skill people. In, in, in my neighborhood, Jonathan, one of the things that you see in California is, well, you could worry about the fact that are people leaving? Housing values have soared throughout yeah. the state. They are at peaks and going up. And again, this has a lot to do with the de-urbanization, meaning the, the the workers move, the talent moves, but not too far away. <laughs> yeah. So no, they may I might, might call that the suburbanization of work. Suburbanization of work. <laughs> but uh, I mean, let, I know we're, we're at almost out of time, but there's one other very important region, I'm sitting in it, <laughs> that uh, we haven't talked about in our report. And uh, I'm going to ask, please sort of turn to you, Mike, if I could, just for any observations on China and how, what role it might be playing in this broader uh, conversation about productivity. Will China's growth momentum China, I mean, has had a quick rebound I, and uh, has obviously had a, uh, a strong performance in economic terms for the uh, for 2020, let alone 2021. There, obviously, there are, our numbers would all show a bit, you know, ahead of the pack, if you will. Uh, but any views on that? I mean, what's the is there is this a noticeable uh, factor to be taken into account in whether or not we see this productivity rebound on a global basis? Hmm. Yeah. So, uh, John. <laughs> Maybe I should ask you the question, <laughs> given your expertise in your location. I'll give it a shot and try to be brief so you can add your insights. I think China's growth projections are real, um, and they imply very rapid productivity growth. So the potential is very large. You know, the per capita incomes are still what, you know, let's call it a quarter of the U.S. ones or something on that order, maybe a little higher now. Um, they're investing very heavily in a full pan of portfolio of things that you know we know are underpinnings of productivity. Um, so there's no shortfall there. It may be driven by you know um, dual circulation economy, greater self-reliance, you know, greater fear of what's going on in the rest of the world. But whatever is causing the the commitment, and they they perceive the tensions that we currently have. I, I don't see any. Any shortfalls in that? China, when it goofs, usually is over investing rather than under investing. It's kind of an outlier in this respect. And the population's not growing and their capital deepening is, you know, not complete, but it's not run, you know, it's not got the horsepower it did, you know, say 15 years ago. So they, they got that part right. It's going to be driven by total factor productivity. And the demographics say that these growth numbers have if they're right and you know uh they have to be accompanied by productivity increases right i mean you you can't have a declining workforce and grow at six percent plus you know and expect to continue that for very long and so bottom line is i think china is in this category india is in this category um there's an explosion of entrepreneurship around the world so i would say there's pretty we're in pretty good shape in a number of you know, Asian countries. Um, but then, then there's some real question marks. I mean, you know, we want to go on tour of the world, but, you know, when you get to Brazil with governance problems, you know, real economic challenges and a pandemic completely out of control, then I think, um, then, then I think you start to draw a line. Final thing I'll say is that my, my impression, and maybe we should do a study on this as a follow up, is that the, the digital technologies that we've talked a lot about are net net quite positive in the in the big emerging economies that is the challenges that we talk about routinely that are real in the advanced economies are somewhat smaller in the opportunities for inclusive growth uh, patterns that are now being documented driven by e-commerce fintech and so on are, are, are very large and and 
and I think being realized and accelerating. Well, I would uh, tend to share that. I mean, in sense that uh, the uh, productivity growth numbers are are pretty real. One of the most interesting numbers I saw was that the average bank employee in China com productivity compared to European bank employees a decade ago was something like 20 percent, uh, and uh, as of three years ago, it was about 50 percent. That is enormous change, and that is just wholly driven by digital. So, uh, and I, so the real question for me would be a bit about the transmission mechanism of all of that productivity growth uh, from China to the world and back and forth. And I will only note that China had an amazing fourth quarter export performance of 6% of GDP higher than it's been in, in a decade, reflecting probably that, you know, it's the last supply chain standing. Uh, now that's not sustainable, but uh, it is interesting to say, at the same time we talk about dual circulation, uh, China is actually going abroad in a big, bigger than it ever has. So I suspect this will have its own set of responses. And uh, as we said, we live in interesting times. Um, so thank you. Um, I, I, I think we're approaching the lightning round. So I have one last question for everybody, uh, which is in one word, okay, two, uh, but uh, what would you say are the odds um, of us achieving 1.5% productivity growth over the next five to 10 years uh, in the US and, uh, and, and Europe respectively. So I guess it's two, so, but, or you could have one if you've had the same view on both of them. Uh, so uh, I will uh, start uh, with you, Martin. <laughs> so you, can add a, you can add an explanation if you want. So. <laughs> I, I think in the United States, the, ch the, the chances are pretty high. I'd put them if you, uh, want a number, I've got them about 50%. I think the chances of it being faster than that, maybe 20%, uh, the chance of being slower, maybe 30%, just because uh, I've been disappointed with, with productivity. I hope Mike is right, and, and all these new technologies do translate into faster productivity, but, but it's been very disappointing. Um, in in Europe, I think it's, it's probably similar. I, I might put the uh, my estimate a little bit lower because uh, Europe is, um, particularly in Southern Europe, has uh, maybe had more structural problems in, in achieving productivity growth. Um, so maybe a 40% chance uh, there, and, and uh, but but a, a good chance even in, in Europe. So I'm broadly optimistic uh, and uh, hope uh, Mike is right and we even go faster than that. Laura? <laughs> Uh, well, I'm quite optimistic on the U.S. Now, actually, I, I noticed the bar there, 1.5% productivity growth over the next five to 10 years. That, that actually isn't the same as an additional one percentage point productivity growth that you have in the study. This is a relatively low bar, I hmm. would say. And, you know, if I think about, again, the productivity growth overall non-farm business economy in the U.S. between 2008 and 2019, before pandemic, that was already around, it was disappointing, but it was disappointing at 1.2%. It was not nothing, okay? So, so I th yes, I'm very, I'm more optimistic than Martin. I would put the odds more like 75 that we will get uh, to greater than 1.5% productivity Good. growth over in the US. I think in Europe, the answer is you have to go country by country. I, I don't think we can answer that question overall for Europe. You know, part of the issue of productivity growth, uh, Michael or Hans mentioned the importance of, the, of leisure and tourism in certain economies. You know, I don't think we're gonna see the productivity growth rates in those sectors. I mean, it's a little bit like the modern version of the Baumol disease. If you, got, if you have sectors of the economy where you can't, where the technology itself is not going to push greater productivity growth, then you're 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 going to end up with a slower overall rate. So I would look at the composition of the economy, and I would look at the fiscal capacity, and I would say the outlook in Europe varies a lot from Germany to Italy to Greece to Spain, etc. <laughs> got it, got it. Um, and Hans Helmut, it depends. That's two words. That's good. <laughs> uh, I do largely agree with uh, Martin and Laura concerning the U.S. 
and it depends very much in Europe on local context, as Laura highlighted. And the Bumol's cost disease is really an issue in services. Uh, but it also depends on how we respond you know, fiscal policy wise. And that's why I'm what concerns Europe uh, more pessimistic than the two of my colleagues I heard up to now. And I bet Michael won't be more optimistic either. And let us find but out, one, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I would, for me, for me, it would be 80% for the US. And um, and I mean, was pretty optimistic about Europe, but I mean, that's probably biased. But, you know, when you look at it from the point of view of investors and they're finding, you know, uh, young entrepreneurs, there's unicorns being built, you know, at some level, maybe it, it'll take a while to show up in macro. So I would say 60% in Europe and 80% for the US. What speaks in uh, your favor, Mike, is of course, um, BioNTech and QWIC. Right. Yeah. Good well, Excellent. now who says economists are a pessimistic bunch? So um, I think the animal spirits are high and I appreciate uh, colleagues all the time. Um, with that, back to you, Janet, for the close. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks to our panelists. Um, really interesting. Thank you so much to Jan, um, who led this research and, and gave us uh, the main findings. And thank you very much, Jonathan, for a masterful uh, handling of our panelists. Thank you very much to everybody who joined us. Um, we ran out of time, um, but we will try to email you answers to your questions. Um, please take a moment to share your feedback. There's going to be a quick uh, three question survey that will appear on your screens. And just lastly, please do download the research at www.mckinsey.com forward slash MGI. And there are two companion pieces, one on the consumer recovery and one on the future of work. And together, we think that they give a good uh, snapshot of what might happen after the post-COVID crisis. So again, thank you very much to everybody for joining and for everybody who took part. <laughs>